This morning I'll be uh, ranging um, all over the New Testament, um, and we'll try and make sure those Bible verses are up on the screens, uh, so I'll be going beyond the verses uh, that Toyin uh, read for us. On a cold Saturday evening, the 21st of January, 1525, a very remarkable thing happened in a little house in Zurich. Anybody know what that is? Well, a man by the name of George Blorock said to another man by the name of Conrad Griebels, Conrad, I beg you, for God's sake, give me the true Christian baptism. So Conrad took a pan of cold water, this is the middle of end of January, um, and, poured, and Zurich, and poured it over Blorick's head. Other people in the room, not many in the room, they all asked for baptism, and so he baptized all of those who requested it. And you're going to ask me, how did an ordinary baptism turn into such a big deal? In Two weeks' time, God willing, we're hoping to have a baptism here. And here was a baptism. I, I know they didn't dip them, uh, immerse them in, in, in the lake, Lake Zurich, probably too cold. Pan of cold water, I don't know if they heated the water, but just a baptism. And you're saying, how on earth was that, that um, extraordinary event? Well, that event signaled the beginning of churches breaking away from the state and becoming individual churches uh, all under Jesus Christ, not under the, Roman, the, the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Individual churches. Now, let me just paint a little bit of the background, because I think this is so important. It has a lot of bearing on what we're going to be saying in the next four weeks. I think many of you know this, but the Roman Catholic Church, by the year 1500, was totally corrupt. Uh, I, I, there were individual Christians, of course, they were all over, dotted all over, but it was filled with man-made traditions, and by 1500 was really utterly corrupt. Bold reformers like John Huss, John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, worked really hard to reform the teachings of the church back to the New Testament. And in Zurich itself, where these baptisms took place, amazing reforms were taking place in the 1500s. Let me give you a couple examples. Images, you know, in the church buildings, the Roman Catholic church buildings, there are all these pictures of the saints, and Christians would come in, people would come in and worship those, and, and, and uh, the Christians there said, no, that's, in the Bible it says, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. So they ripped all those images and and sculptures and pictures out of the churches. Amazing. And then communion, which they call the mass, was so filled with human traditions. We've had a lovely, simple communion this morning. But in those days, all sorts of human traditions had come in. Let me give you a couple. The first was, the priest used to, used to think, and the people used to think, that they were sacrificing Jesus again every time they had the mass. What does Hebrews 10 say? Jesus was sacrificed once for all. And then, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Only the priest drank the wine. I think there's a bit, something a bit fishy there. A bit fishy there, right? All, everyone had the bread, but only the priest had the wine. And Matthew 26, 27, we read, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, all the disciples in the upper room, drank communion, not just the priests. That little group of Christians who met on the 21st of January were taking another step of reformation by separating themselves from the state. Because when we come to the, book of the New Testament, we find that the church is here and the state is there. The church doesn't tell the state what to do, although tries to influence it by God's grace. And the state 
cannot tell the church what to do. And if the church, if the state does tell the church what to do, and the church doesn't want to do that, it suffers persecution. Now, if you're puzzled this morning, how on earth can a few pans of water over a few people's heads be, cause the separation of church and state? I've written a little book. My little humble contribution, and um, this is the end of the advertisement, but if you'd like a copy, Yvonne has some this morning. That little baptizing adults, believing adults, was as radical as any other act in the Reformation, conducted with great fear, and the consequences of it were very savage uh, upon that little group of people. Every independent church today enjoys Bible freedom from the state because of that little meeting on the 21st of January, 1525. Now, if I can't persuade any of you to join me, I'm going to find a little cupcake and a birthday candle from my cupboard in the kitchen. And next January, the 21st, it's just around the corner, it's Tuesday, next January, I'm going to have a little anniversary, 500th year anniversary, all on my own unless Nathan wants to join me, because um, that will be 500 years. In 1517, okay, in 2017, people celebrated the great uh, Martin Luther's Reformation when he nailed the thesis on the door of the church in Wittenberg saying, I want to debate all these things that are wrong. But actually, in 1525, Eight years later, something just as important happened. And so I'm going to get my cupcake out, maybe a few of us, and I'm going to celebrate that, that great event. Now, why on earth am I beginning with that story? I'm beginning because Satan tries to lure the church away, away from the New Testament in every age. Do you think it's just the reformers who needed, that, that age needed reforming? Uh, Satan is always trying to subtly uh, move the churches, true churches, away from their moorings in the New Testament. Um, just because we call ourselves evangelical Christian, do you know what that word means? When you, when you hear the word an evangelical church, you know what it means? It means a Bible-believing church. That's what it means. That doesn't mean we have everything right. And from time to time, it is both humble and wise and prudent to prayerfully look at ourselves and ask, do we look like the church of the New Testament? Have human traditions unwittingly been brought into the church from the world and by God's grace need changing? Um, I gave an example last week uh, in, way, uh, in, in which the evangelical church has been led astray by the world in recent years. We play the numbers game. Out there in the world, numbers are everything. All secular judgments in the world are made according to the rule of numbers. Pop stars are judged by how many fans they have. People are judged by the number of pounds in their banks. And the evangelical church, that's us, churches and teachers are judged right across the board with no exceptions known to myself by how many degrees they have, how many books they have authored, how big their churches are, or how popular they are. And that is a worldly way of assessing truth. Because Jesus had only 12 followers, and he was poor, and he wrote no books. And I think to myself, he would be completely overlooked by many people in our modern evangelical church. The only test of truth and value is, does this teacher, does this church preach the Bible? It is the only test of truth. Numbers are utterly irrelevant. I think God has been saying that to the evangelical church over the last 10 years with one fall after another of mega pastors. They've been falling like flies, and God is saying, look at these guys who you put on a pedestal because of all their great numbers. It's time to reform yourself and begin looking at everybody and every church, nothing to do with numbers, but everything to do with how they line up with the teaching 
of God's word. So um, for four Sunday mornings, we're going to be reformers. I hope that's okay. We are going to use the four core principles that we've included in all our vision statements for many years as our Reformers Charter. If you've never come across this document, every three years um, the, the elders get together, we prayerfully think about where God is leading us, and uh, it's not set in stone. Who knows where God may lead us, even next year? But it's wise to begin thinking prayerfully about where to go, and four core principles are there in all of them. If you don't have a copy of that, go to Russ, and he'll give you a copy. So we're going to use those four core principles roughly as our guidelines. So I have three reasons for this mini-series of sermons, four sermons only, today, next week, baptism, then two, other, two after that. First of all, to reform our thinking on what the Bible teaches about the church. That's our main focus, okay? It is not really about other doctrines, uh, but our doctrine of the church Secondly, to remind ourselves of where we all stand on the church. It's wonderful to have new folks uh, join us, and we all want to be united in our vision of what the local church is. And thirdly, this term is likely to be quite a momentous term for us as a fellowship. We are too large to facilitate the family feel that we find in the New Testament. So as many of you know, we are working towards a church plant God willing, in Malvern. So all of us need to understand why we are doing this. Those who will leave us and those who remain, why not just become bigger and bigger and bigger? Because we are convinced that smaller churches serve the purposes of God's kingdom better than larger churches. You may not agree with that, but that's how we believe it. I don't know if you ever bought toys from our... Toys R Us, did you? It's all shut down now, isn't it? But um, um, I thought I'd make a new logo for us. Okay. So let me call you. Is there somebody here who wants to join the church plant at Melvin? Who wants to stop coming here on a Sunday morning in January and start wants to join that church? That's our passion. Our passion is, the, is to have small churches where everybody knows everybody and where gifts can emerge rather than in a big church where you, you kind of think, oh, I, I, I think I have that gift, but I'm sure John's got a better gift than I do, or Jane has a better gift. Smaller churches facilitate the gifts that God gives to, be, to emerge. So I'm going to be challenging you on many occasions in the last, next four weeks. Um, please leave Manor Park Church. So are you with me? Four sermons for th with three reasons. To reform our thinking and practice, to foster unity by reminding ourselves where we stand collectively, and to explain why we are committed to the difficult but wonderful task of church planting. Now, I've just got seven very simple truths to share with you. I don't think any of these truths are radical, but you may find them radical. So it may be that this, some, some of this is new, but here are seven truths about the church from the New Testament that every single Christian should be aware of. And the first one is the simplest. Church is the people. You know that in the New Testament, the word church is used in two ways, and both of those ways refer only to people. So the first way the New Testament uses the word church is when it's describing a little local gathering like this group. To the church of God in Corinth. To the church of God in Galatia. So there, Paul is writing to a group of Christians. And then the other way this word is used is to describe the global church of everybody who's ever been converted and everyone who ever will be converted, the whole church that one day we will only see in the world to come. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church. Now, in both of those uses in the New Testament, the word church only refers to people. 
Now you say, why do I begin with this ABC truth? Because out there in the world, the word is used wrongly all the time. Buildings are not churches. We got that straight? They are buildings where Christians may meet, but churches are not build buildings are not churches. Only flesh and blood, not bricks and mortar, can be called a church. So the world's got it wrong. Denominations are not churches. Church of England or Methodist Church. Those are human, man-made institutions, whatever you think of them. But only flesh and blood can be called church. And we all got that clear. The only entity in the New Testament that can be called a church is a group of flesh and blood people who are believers. Now, uh, I hope that it's not radical to you, but it might be. And one very simple application is we do not need a religious building to be called a proper church. I am delighted that Manor Park Church, 25 years old next year, uh, doesn't own any property. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. That's exactly what all the churches in the New Testament were like. None of them owned buildings. All of them met in homes or right at the beginning in the temple courts. Do you remember that? Many church plants, can I just say this, who start off in homes or community centers or schools, pine for the day when they become a proper church, by which they mean when they get their own building. I've come across that so often. A little group, and they've been meeting for 10 years in a little hall, and they're thinking, oh, we're not really a proper church because we're not like this church or that church with a building. That's wrong thinking. They are the church, and you do not need a religious building to be a church. We need to be very clear that, because church is people. Simple one. Number two, church is about people who have been called out of the world. Do you know the Greek word that uh, when you read the, the New Testament is written in Greek. And so when you read the word church, underneath that in the Greek, it's ecclesia. And ecclesia is a compound word from two other Greek words, ek, out of, from, and kalio, called out of, called. Called out of. Church is made up of people who have been called out of the world. That lovely verse, isn't it, in 1 Peter? God has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Light. So church is a group of people who've been called by God out of the world to meet together in a brand new community called the church. Uh, did you know that according to the New Testament, there are only two groups of people in the world? There's the world and there's the church. That's it. All of mankind is divided right down the middle, not this room, right down the middle between the world and the church. You are either in the world or you're in the church. Jesus is praying, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Christians are ecclesia. They have been called out of the world to be a unique and new community. And there are two applications for that. First of all, we are not born into the church. We are called by God into the church. If you were born into a Christian home, that does not make you a Christian. Lovely to have some of our young people being baptized in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, what they're recognizing is it isn't, being, and it isn't being born in a Christian home that makes you a Christian. You have to have heard God's call, and his call comes through the Scriptures, comes through preaching. One day, you hear God calling you through the Gospel. And you respond in, in faith and repentance and obedience. The second application is two groups of people in the world, church and world. Who are your best friends? If you are a Christian here this morning, and uh, you, th therefore your new community ought to be made predominantly up of the church. Of course, we're in the world during the week we have to share the gospel with the world. Sometimes we live with unbelievers. 
But the people who we love the most and hang out with the most must be our church friends. If that is not true of you, I need to say you need to do something about that before the world pulls you away. I love your church, O Lord. This is a hymn. Her saints before you stand, dear as the apple of your eye and graven on your hand. I love your church, O Lord. Can you say that? Who, 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 who are the people you hang out with most Monday to Saturday? It ought to be God's people. And if it isn't, you do need to change your ways. You need to make friends of God's children. Moving swiftly on, what is so special about the church? Church is much more than people. The church is gathered in the is people gathered in the name of Jesus. Jesus, when he went to heaven, Matthew 28, the end of that chapter, is some of my favorite verses. Jesus is going back to heaven and he says, Behold, I am with you always. Jesus says, I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age. And you think, well, how on earth can Jesus be with me when he's gone to heaven, ascended, glorified? He's not in this world anymore. Well, he sent his spirit. Don't you know that you yourselves, Paul says to the whole gathered church, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? 1 Corinthians 3.16. The, the Bible has these two, two teachings. You individually are the uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. I am. You are. And then we corporately, whenever God's people meet, are also the temple of God's Spirit. So Jesus can say, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. How is he here today? How is he here today? He's here by his Spirit. And that's a very awesome truth. That this morning... I know Jesus is with us day by day in our places of work, on our own, in our homes. But there is a very special presence and a very special blessing when we gather together as his people in his name, like we're doing right now and like we do in our home groups. Did you know that? The gathered church is where the Holy Spirit dwells. And Jesus dwells by his spirit among us. He's here. He's here today. He's here now. I think we sense it sometimes, don't we, and know it. A very simple application is since Jesus is present in a special way among his people to encourage and bless, you and I ought to do everything in our power to be among God's people on the Lord's day. Is that right? If we love our kids, then they need to be here every Lord's Day too. Because here is blessing, even life everlasting. Number four, church communities act differently from the world. This is the fourth church. Every Christian ought to know that the way the church does its business, does its life, is very different from the way the world does its business. Um, the two, Paul's two letters to the, the, the church at Corinth are filled with this. The church at Corinth did everything in a worldly way. And Paul is having to correct them. You're worldly. You're worldly, you Corinthians. You know the sort of things they did? They took each other to court when they had a tiff. What are Christians meant to do? Take one another to court? No, they're meant to forgive one another. Not take each other to court. 1 Corinthians 6. They prized human strength. And Paul has to remind them that God uses weak people instead of those with worldly strength. You think of it. What was the mightiest act in the history of the whole world? What was the mightiest act in the history of the whole world? It looked, the cross looked like an embarrassing failure in the eyes of the world. For the weakness of God is stronger 
than man's strength. This, this Corinthian church was all into powerful people and strong people, and they were probably neglecting the weak people, weak people in their congregation. And Paul has to remind them the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. They loved clever-sounding philosophy and doctrine, but God uses what the world calls foolishness. Have you ever thought of what a simple gospel we have to share to the world? It's about a man who died for your sins. And if you repent and believe, you'll be saved. That's it. To the world, that's madness and folly. It's not philosophically challenging. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Are you with me? What they did was they, they dragged all the foolish thinking of the world into the church. And I need to say here this morning that everything we do in church will be different from the way the world works. Here's a classic example which I have just noticed as a pastor over the last 30 years. Take the way missionary work happens these days. Worldly thinking has entered all our, well, many of our missionary societies. In days gone by, somebody would hear the call of God, go to be a missionary in India, Africa, or wherever. They'd get up, they'd go. They would trust that God would meet all their financial needs, the health needs of their children. And he did. And he did so abundantly. Read the biographies. God watched over all of them. But today, before you go abroad, if you want to be a missionary, you've got to make sure you've got enough money, enough medical insurance, pensions, everything. Where is the faith? We're worldly. We're worldly. Can you imagine Paul starting out on his missionary journeys today? Wow, you can't. Insurance for shipwreck and riots, medical cover for beatings. Frankly, I thank God Paul was born in the first century, because if he was born today, no Western church would send him on those journeys. We become, we become worldly. We become, we're, we're lacking in faith, we're lacking in taking risks and trusting God to do the great things. So when we do church, we must make sure we're acting always in line with the New Testament. We must consciously say, is this a worldly way of doing things or is this in line with faith and the Holy Spirit and power and sanctification and trusting God? Number five, in the fifth place, the church is an ordered community. Let's make it very clear this morning that everyone in this room is equal in Christ. Is that right? For there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. There is no hierarchies in the church. Do we all understand that? Nevertheless, there is order in the church. There's a difference between hierarchy and order. The, the world doesn't get this difference. It, it, it's true in the, the Godhead, it's true in marriage, and it's true in the church. In, 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 in marriage, the, the, the husband is the head of the home. He's the head of the wife. It doesn't make him better, but there is a divine order. There is no hierarchy, but there's order. In the Godhead, Father is the first person, the Son is the second person, and the Spirit is the third person. All are equally God, but the Father sends the Son. The Son never sends the Father, and the Father and the Son send the Spirit, but the Spirit never sends the Son or the Father. There's a divine order. And so in the church... God is appointed there to be elders who care for and lead the church. We're an elder-led church. There are deacons, wonderful deacons, who take care of all the practical responsibilities. And then there is the congregation. It comes out beautifully, I think, in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers, that's the elders, 
and the deacons. So at Manor Park, you may ask, why do we have elders, seven elders? Perfect number, but we're not perfect at all. Um, why do we have, I don't know, a dozen deacons, maybe more than that? Uh, why do we do that? Because we see the pattern in Scripture of having elders who spiritually lead the church, deacons who help with all the practical things so faithfully. It's not something uh, to take for granted. We, we, we thank God for the harmonious way, these three groups, I don't like to divide them into three, but just for the sake of explanation, how the members and the elders and the deacons work together. We thank God for the harmony we enjoy here, and may it always be true. Number six, very basic, the church should be an outward-looking community. Uh, I'm back to Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and earth, these are some of Jesus' very last words. Um, we ought to take a lot of atten- pay a lot of attention to his last words. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's the mandate God has placed on the church. Someone once said, have you heard this, that the church is the only institution in the world that exists for the benefit of non-members. Have you heard that? the only institution, all the other institutions, golf clubs, whatever, they exist for their members. But the church is the only institution that exists for the benefit of non-members. Only partially true, isn't it? It's only partially true. Because the church exists for the encouragement and comfort of all its members, but we are called to love and welcome those outside. And I trust that drives all our outreach, You've got that sheet. There are five, five meetings this term where they're a little bit easier to, more accessible. That's it. The nice, pretty color one. Is there someone you could invite to one of those? A friend, a relative, a neighbor. Be bold. Because our task is to reach, make everyone disciples. Invite them in. Are you with me? I'm almost finished. The church is people called out of the world, gathered in Jesus' name, acting differently from the world, an ordered community with members, elders, and deacons, outward-looking, and finally, and supremely, the church has only one overall leader, one head, and he is in heaven. And he, Jesus Christ, is the head, not a head, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. In the New Testament, I want you to see this next slide. I want you to see the model of the church. Can you see that? Oh, can you see that? In the New Testament, we have lots of little individual churches They're all governed by their own local elders, and they are accountable only to Jesus. There are no bishops. There are no popes. There are no archbishops in the Bible. Can you get that? We're there. We're one of those groups. And as a group of God's people, we are accountable only to to Jesus Christ. There are, so, so here Paul, he's, he's leaving the church at Ephesus. He's talking to the leaders, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherd of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The Bible knows of no bishops, no national leaders, no denominations, no popes, just lots of little churches And we all have fellowship with one another, but we are accountable only to Jesus. The Bible knows nothing of popes, nothing of denominations, nothing of archbishops. These are man-made traditions whose authority you and I do not recognize. I do not recognize the Bishop of Worcester 
as my spiritual leader. I do not, hallelujah, um, I do not recognize the Archbishop of Canterbury as my leader. I recognize only Jesus Christ as my head. So that might be radical to you this morning. The Bible knows nothing of these man-made traditions. Do you know why God has designed the church without any human hierarchies? Have you ever wondered why didn't he put denominations in there? So like, you know, you've got seven churches and then there's a bishop over them and then there's another seven over here. I think I can move. And there's another bishop over them and then there's like a suit in the intermediate bishop and then there's a kind of a high bishop and a top bloke. Why has God not designed the church like that? Because the very best Christians you will ever meet, including myself and every preacher who has ever lived, are imbalanced to some degree, partial, prejudiced, limited, parochial, nepotistic. I've got all these works that, words now. <laughs> Selfish, imperfect sinners. You cannot trust power to any human being. And I think God's been saying that to the evangelical church. I don't know if you keep up with the news. One after another, the big shot leaders in the evangelical church have fallen in the last 10 years. As if God is shouting out, drop all these big guys. Stop thinking as the world thinks. In the Bible, we just have little local churches, another one and then another one, and they are not accountable to denominations. They are accountable to Jesus Christ alone. The other reason God hasn't designed hierarchies because as soon as one guy goes at the top, he makes all of the others underneath him stumble. God knows what he's doing when he designed the church. And he doesn't want any human institutions to come in the way. We plant community church warned in and we let them go. They don't become subservient to us. I heard uh, an African friend of mine talking about his pastor in Africa. And his, his friend, it might even have been his brother, is a relative, uh, was, was the pastor of a, a church plant from a mega church in Africa. And that little church plant was being demanded by the mother church for money. They were being told by the parent church what to teach every Sunday. Talk about human hierarchies. It's worldly. You plant a church and you let it go. That's what Paul does. He plants a church and he lets it go. He trusts the Spirit to lead them. You don't set up new hierarchies in which all of a sudden the person at the top goes astray and everybody else also goes astray. We really need to understand this last one, that there is only one head of the church and he's invisible. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, absolutely loving, with no prejudices and no biases and no errors and no imperfections, the one by whom and for whom all things were created, the one who was before all things and in whom all things hold together, the one in whom God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And to him and to him alone be all the glory forever. Amen. Amen.